If you love something, you protect it. You defend it. You find ways to keep it safely away from the threats and perils of a dangerous world. Such is, and always has been, the true nature of love. And that's what God's love does for us. He protects us. No need to build walls to hide behind. God's love is stronger than the mightiest fortress. That's why he says, don't build walls of defensiveness. Let me love you, and you can live in the openness of my protection where not even the fiercest attack can separate you from me. If you've been hiding behind physical or emotional walls, here's the good news. The future belongs to those who depend solely on God for protection. And that can be you. Sound encouraging? Stay tuned. Let's join the worshiping congregation of the First Presbyterian Church of Hollywood and discover how to face the future with expectancy. Zechariah was a prophet to the people of God when they returned from exile to Jerusalem. He heard the word of the Lord through visions in which the Lord communicated to him what the people needed to hear about the future. One of those visions is the focus of our attention today. It's in the second chapter of Zechariah, the first five verses. Hear the word of the Lord. Then I raised my eyes and looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. So I said, where are you going? And he said to me, to measure Jerusalem, to see what is its width and what is its length. And there was an angel who talked with me going out, and another angel was coming out to meet him, who said to him, run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls because of the multitude of men and livestock in it. For I, says the Lord, will be a wall of fire around her, and I will be the glory in her midst. Let us pray. Oh, dear God, bless us that we might receive your strength and courage to face the future unafraid. To your glory and honor. Amen. As I sat in the Atlanta airport waiting to board a plane, my attention was arrested by a wonderful young man who sat across from me waiting to board the plane. The flight attendants seemed very solicitous. They hovered around him, wanting to be sure that uh, he was comfortable and ready to board the flight and all of his needs met. They gave him some junior wings to put on and uh, cocked a pilot's cap uh, on his head, and he smiled with appreciation. It was with confidence that he walked onto the plane. The flight attendants surrounding him still, being sure that everything was all right. And to my delight, he was seated next to me. Well, during the flight, uh, the air was very turbulent, and that great big jumbo jet was tossed around like a feather in a cyclone. I looked at the little boy thinking that he would be fidgeting with all sorts of fear and worry. Not so. He adjusted his pilot's cap and polished his wings and did coloring in the special children's book that the flight attendants had given him. He didn't seem concerned at all. He dangled his legs and hummed 
The plane was bouncing all around. <laughs> Everyone was worried and troubled that we might never make it. Well, seated across the aisle was a hen-like lady. <laughs> and she, she sort of bobbed her head around like a mother hen. And I don't know if hens can talk, but if they could, they would sound like this lady. And she bobbed her head as she reached across and she said, Young man, aren't you frightened? And he looked at her and smiled and said, No, ma'am. My daddy's the pilot. And he knows where we're going. And ma'am, he can get us there. I want to tell you, I pushed the lever and leaned back in my chair. <laughs> Some words uh, spoken by E. Stanley Jones came floating into my mind. Someone else might have said them long before he's Stanley Jones, but uh, I want to tell you, he spoke them with courage and with authenticity. Remember those words? I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. Can you say that? Do you know the pilot? And are you sure that he knows where you're going and that he can get you there safely? Tell me, how do you feel about the future? Tomorrow and all of the tomorrows, frightened, uncertain, worried, filled with panic, wonderment, what is it for you? When the people of God came back to Jerusalem, they were filled with uncertainty as to what the future held for them. And they had one thing in mind, stabilize life, get it back to the way it was. Their only security was in the reestablishment of all of the accoutrements of sameness. They wanted to rebuild the temple, get the wall up so that they could be protected, for they knew what it was like to be attacked. And God appointed a prophet. And in the year 519 B.C., he had a series of eight visions, and one of them is particularly applicable to our attitude toward the future. He went to sleep with a problem on his mind. Have you ever gone to sleep and uh, fallen asleep before you finished praying <laughs> and so that you work through what was unfinished all through the night? Sometimes it uh, manifests itself in agitated sleep. You can't quite rest. And sometimes it invades your dreams Often, those dreams are a vision from God telling you something about your life that you might have been afraid to articulate or grapple with in your conscious moments. Well, Zechariah had gone to sleep with the needs of his people on his heart. He was terribly concerned about this desire to build another rut of sameness and do what had been done before and return to the past. And so in this vision, he saw a young man, a surveyor, with a measuring line in his hand, going to measure Jerusalem. And then suddenly, in the vision, an angel appeared. And then another angel spoke to the first angel and said, run, catch that young man, stop him. 
And they said, where are you going? And the young man said, to measure Jerusalem. And then the word of God came. Jerusalem shall be builded as without walls, and I will be the glory within her. No wonder Zechariah woke up in a cold sweat, because the vision spoke to the need that he felt in himself and in his people. The surveyor was going to measure Jerusalem according to the previous measurements. All he wanted to do was to get that wall back up the way it was. He failed to see what God had been teaching all through the exile, that he would use his people, he would bless them to be a blessing among the nations of the world. And then an amazing thing happens. As you follow the dialogue between the two angels, you see that one is a particular angel, as a matter of fact, a divine figure. In my understanding of the passage, the very presence of the Son of God, the Word of God, who put all things together in the beginning. And he's the one who speaks and says, that there will come a time when Jerusalem will not be able to contain all of the people and the nations will come and I will dwell in their midst and the Lord of hosts will send me, capital M, to you. Amazing. The passage of Scripture shocks us and wakes us up with a cold sweat. For many of us are simply perpetuating the past. We spend all of our lives trying to rebuild the walls of defensiveness to maintain what was, rather than pressing on to God's new vision and fresh strategy for us. I believe that there are three kinds of people May I share them with you? You may find yourself in one of these categories. First of all, there are the antiquarians. Their quest is constantly to keep things as they were. Remember that story of the ladies' aid in a church in Georgia? They put out an announcement all over the city, said, the ladies' aid will have a rummage sale. Bring old things too old to use, but too good to throw away, and your husbands are invited. <laughs> Someone didn't check that copy. H.G. <laughs> Wells tells the story of two men standing in a coliseum, looking down, and one said, Oh, just to think of the great men who stood here. And the other said, and just to think of the great men who will stand here. Two attitudes toward life. One that wants to recapture the past and use it as a defensive wall, holding life at bay. And then there's the adventuresome, the person who looks forward to the future. The antiquarian is the person who makes a norm out of the past for the present. We know them everywhere. Perhaps there's a bit of that in you, where you want somehow to bring into the presence of the present those things that worked for you in the past, stifles growth, stunts us, keeps us what we were. It's just a repetition of what was, and it misses that promise of God, that he will be the wall of defense for us and that his glory will dwell within us. The repetition of the past is dangerous. It keeps us from focusing on our real goals. Secondly, there's a group of people who are what I might call the maintenance people. They are people who make a 
norm out of the present for the future. The future is fine if it's a perpetuation of what we have now. It ends up simply maintaining life as it is. Now the defensive wall is the accumulation of all of the accoutrements of our accomplishment. Now what's important is keeping life in order so that nothing will happen to what we have. I remember sitting on an airplane with a man and he said, you know, if this plane went down today, it'd be great. I said, what? <laughs> he said, yeah, I've done all that I want to do. I've accomplished everything that I want to accomplish. And if it went down now, I'd go down in a blaze of glory. You know, there are a lot of people like that. They wish they could kind of put a punctuation mark and get all the accolades now and say, hey, it's all over for me. I've accomplished everything I ever wanted to accomplish. And so all of the rest of life is simply being a maintenance agent, keeping the future in the norm of the present. Ever feel like that? And yet, our Lord is the one who constantly goes before us breaking the future open because whatever we've experienced in the past is nothing in comparison to what he has for us in the future. Now, the third category is the superintendent. Now, you know my love for etymology and uh, picking words apart, and I like compound words in the Latin simply because they just pile a lot of thoughts all into one word, and when you take them apart, you get something. It's, it's like digging for a treasure, and when you dig it all out, you've got something that you didn't know was there. Super means over. Intendere means to stretch out toward a goal. So that a superintendent is one who is over the stretching out toward the goal. Not a maintenance but a stretching forward. Now, the superintendent placed in his responsibility by God is one who makes the future the norm for the present. What a difference. If we take our calculations from the future for what we ought to be doing in the present, it radically changes what we do in the now. Oscar Levant, that uh, wonderful humorist and pianist, was busy playing Chopin at the height of a wonderful concert. Everything was quiet except for the beautiful playing of the music. And at one of the most delicate moments, the telephone in the stage manager's office rang off the wall. And Levan, without missing a note or a beat, said, If that's for me, tell them I'm busy. <laughs> I believe that when we have our eyes focused on our ultimate purpose and destiny, that we can say, If that's for me, Tell them I'm busy. When all of the discordant noise and conflict and uncertainties of life distract us, there's a wonderful freedom to be able to do in the now what will prepare us forever. You see, every moment in the now is coefficient with eternity. And what we do now all factors out in the kind of person we will be for eternity. Every so often I find it's important to begin to wonder, am I doing now what I'll enjoy doing in heaven? Hmm. You know, if we have been called to eternal life, that means that heaven has begun, that death is not an ending only a transition in the eternity we are called to live. 
And if heaven has begun, we ought to be doing what they do in heaven. That's the reason that the future is the norm for the present. What we will ultimately be ought to dominate what we are right now. And that, for me, means three things. To glorify God in everything that we do. Secondly, it means to grow in His grace in all of the manifold ups and downs of life. Everything will have accomplished its purpose if it brings us closer to Him. And lastly, our goal is to gratify the needs of people. That is, to bring them delight and ultimate satisfaction. Now you see why Jesus could say, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all of these things will be added unto you. He was lifting people away from the things that made them worry about the future. He was focusing their attention on what really counts. And then the present takes care of itself. Well, what that means is simply this. What difference does it make if in the future we will know difficulties, adversities, ill health, problems, frustrations, broken relationships, tough times? What difference? if we press on toward our ultimate goal. You see, you and I are destined and sealed to be delivered in heaven. And if that's the case, anything that happens in between now and then doesn't really matter that much. Do you believe that? I do. There is no greater freedom than that wonderful release that comes when we give our lives to Jesus Christ and commit ourselves to do nothing other than to glorify Him, to grow in His grace, and to gratify the needs of others by sharing his love with them, meeting their physical and spiritual needs, and extending the kingdom. We don't have to rebuild the old wall. We don't need to be defensive anymore because the wall of defense around us is the fire of the presence of God and his glory dwelling within. Aren't you afraid, Lloyd? My father is the pilot. <laughs>